Hello, everyone, and thank you again for joining us at the 2022 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Mike Duke, and I am a first-year MBA student at MIT Sloan. I'm excited to present the next panel, uh, Swim, Bike, Run Data, the Next Frontier for Human Performance. Uh, our panelists here, we have Ian McGregor, co-founder and CEO of Scratch Labs. We have Dr. Alan Lim, sports physiologist, professional cycling coach, and Scratch Labs co-founder, and Kira D'Amato, professional runner for Nike and inside tracker endurance team. And moderating this panel, we have John Lovett, host of the For the Long Run podcast. Um, the panel will be 45 minutes, followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. You can submit questions uh, through the Twitter using the hashtag, hashtag data for endurance. Uh, I'll hand it to you, John. Awesome, thank you. Um, thank you everyone for, uh, for coming today. Um, appreciate the intros here. Uh, I had a chance to catch up with the, the three guests here. And we're here at a panel for data for endurance. But what I found to be interesting with the conversation, in the conversations that I had with them prior is they talked a lot about the, the overlap between, or the art and the science, and the overlap of such. So we're going to get into it. We're going to talk about the science, but we're also going to weave the, the art portion in because, um, as, as you'll hear from the three of them, um, data is data, and it's how you apply that data, which is what helps really the, which is what helps the application and, and how, to, um, how to take advantage of, of that information. Um, so recognizing that this is an endurance panel, we all are involved in exercising for a living in some capacity. Um, and let's start there. So Kira, what, what motivates you to get up and get going in, in the morning? Um, that's a really good question. So for me, I'm on this pursuit of progress and I want to test my limits and I get real excited thinking that I haven't found my limits yet. So for me, I wake up every morning and it's, I'm a runner, so it's how fast can I get? And that is incredibly exciting for me. And so far you've gotten faster than every other American woman. So we're excited to see how, how far that can go. Yeah, I keep telling people, I'm getting older, but I'm also getting faster. So uh, yeah, I'll just continue on this progress train. Um, Dr. Alan Lim, how about you? What, what gets you going in the morning? Um, geez, I don't know. Uh, latent Catholic angst and immigrant hustle. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think mostly, though, a desire to help people get better. Right? So I'm on the other side of where Kira's at in terms of how can I facilitate that speed. And Ian McGregor, how about you? Yeah, I think it's curiosity and uh, just sort of always wondering what's around the next corner. Um, and if we don't get up, get out of bed, we'll never know. Another, another piece that I found interesting between the three of you is, is that curiosity aspect. You just hear, heard Kira talk about it. It's how good can I get? Um, through the podcast I host, I've spoken with 200 people, and many of them are professional Olympic-level Olympic athletes. And what I found to be fascinating is that when you ask these athletes what are their goals, they don't give you a tangible, I want to run a marathon in 219.11. 12. I know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that should have been my goal, yeah. <laughs> um, it's not, I want to win an Olympic gold medal. It's, I want to continue getting better. So with that in mind, where the context is, I want to get better versus here's a tangible goal, where many coaches work with tangible goals. Um, maybe, Alan, you can, you can take this one to say, how do you, how do you help take an athlete who has, has a goal that's tangible and translate the, the data into, into helping them achieve that goal? Where do, you, where do you start? Yeah, I think where people miss the picture sometimes with that data and with that goal is to have an accurate reflection of where that athlete has been, right? So there's so much in an athlete's history that potentially predicts what they can do in the future. And if you can draw a line between that history and where they want to go, it gives you the pathway, you know, to, depending upon the, the time. And, you know, I generally have this notion that um, you don't win on your best day, you win on an average day. Right? And so how do you make your average performance the performance that you want? Because there's always some normal distribution around that. Right? So Ian, you've spent some time as a, as a high-level athlete as well. 
I'm curious your, your take on that. Yeah, thanks, John. I think where my mind goes in this is sort of this distinction between uh, extrinsic goals, right? Thinking about I want to win this or I want to be uh, create this outcome versus intrinsic goals, which are the things that I can control. And um, you know, if I wake up in the morning at a national championship, let's say, and I don't win, um, I don't want to consider that day a failure. Uh, just because somebody was better than I was on that day, uh, but rather focus on the, the steps that I do have uh, at least the uh, illusion of control over. Totally. Um, in that same realm of, of having control um, and being able to use that data in, in a controlling aspect, I'm curious, can everyone put their hand up if they're wearing a smartwatch? Oh, man. Okay. Wow. <laughs> put your hand, keep your hand up if, you, if your smartwatch informs anything about what you do later that day. Let's say you wake up, it tells you something. So it's a, a lot of hands go down. <laughs> um, just an interesting observation. Um, Kira, let's talk about first thing in the morning. Um, how, are, how are you tracking? How are you measuring? How are you using data, um, both at a macro level on a week-by-week -week basis, but also micro, like, OK, today is Friday. Uh, my sleep was like this. My Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Yeah, it's it's crazy because so in my first round of running right out of college in the early 2000s, there was no technology, there was no data. I had a chronological watch that was all I can track. And now I literally wake up and I won't name the mattress, but I get a sleep number with my sleep score. You just did. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but for me, that's such even just waking up and knowing the quality of sleep. That's my most important recovery tool as an athlete: how I'm sleeping. So if I wake up and see that it wasn't a great night of sleep, I either can think I'm overtraining, maybe it was just an awkward night with kids or whatever. But that is such a just to start out the day with knowing how great of sleep I had. Um, and then I check my watch and I'm kind of thinking, what do I need to do? It has my miles that I've already done that week and how many miles I need to do. So immediately I start the day with all of this data to help me kind of like you just said, inform the decision for my day for, for athletics. Very cool. Uh, prior to the panel, we were talking about how to log and measure volume or intensity on a week by week basis. I'm curious your take on how athletes can and should be looking at um, more so the macro side of, of volume? So, you know, I think that um, one of the issues is that we now live in a world where so many things can be measured that we forget that the simplest metric can inform the whole process, right? And that maybe the most important measure is the one that you can do every single day, right? Um, for most athletes, the one thing that you have is you have time. Right? You can measure that time. And the other thing that you have, which is pretty old school, is a perception of how hard that effort was. To date, probably the most robust measure of training load, if you want to know how hot the stove is, is something called Foster's Index. And all that is is your training time in minutes multiplied by how hard you thought that was on a scale of 1 to 10. It is so, so simple. But the reason why it's so robust in the training literature is because you can use this for any sport and any person can make this mark, right? And because of that, it becomes consistent data. And if you're gonna actually meaningfully understand a system, it doesn't matter if that system is highly accurate, right? It matters that it's highly reliable in terms of being able to collect that data. Right? The noise will fall out of it. But if you've got big pockets where there isn't any information, you start to lose sense of it. I have a friend who, um, let's just say she's very successful as an athlete. And she said that he's one of the smartest people in the world when it comes to sports science. And you just heard one of those very simple takeaways that's a, that's a meta-analysis, essentially, of, of everything he's learned and all of the things that he's seen and tracked and measured. And it's as simple as, how do you feel multiplied by what did you do? Yeah. Um, Ian, you talked on a similar note about a concept called praxis. Do you want to explain what that is and, and how, that, um, how that is relevant here as well? Yeah, sure. Thanks, John. And, you know, I don't know that this is the dictionary definition, but the one that I've adopted. So, you know, give me a little buffer here if uh, you feel differently or have better information than I do. But, you know, we, 
with science, right, we like to reduce things down and figure out what individual component is causing what individual outcome. And while that might make sense in a lab presence, oftentimes, um, at least anecdotally in my own experience, right, we find different outcomes in the quote unquote real world. Um, so this idea of praxis is sort of bringing, you know, that lab world into the real world and figuring out where they cross, where they connect, um, where they seem to align. And it's, it's not always in those places that the data seems to suggest uh, or that we find in a, in a lab or a controlled environment. Yeah, and you, you expanded on that and, and suggested that one of the things that had troubled you about the world of analytics is that sometimes we take that single data point with absolute accuracy and we don't, and we ignore the distribution or range of uncertainty and we don't really understand the exceptions. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, I think where my mind points with that is think about our own selves and whether you know it's the day where we woke up and we had enormous patience with our kids um, or maybe the day where we woke up and we didn't have any patients with our kids. And where I get curious is, is what's happening between those two states? Uh, I may be the same person. Maybe I slept the same number of hours the night before. Maybe I you know, drank or didn't drink or had this to eat or that to eat. Um, but obviously there's a range of outcomes that can happen for us as individuals. And the same you know, comes to the forefront in athletics, right? We have our, our best day, our average day, right? We have days where we set, you know, records. Um, but we don't do that every day. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, maybe a fallacy that comes from these watches that most people have on is that the number is the answer. And uh, we think, we forget about the range of possibility within ourselves, let alone populations, on, on any given day or what that number may mean. Um, fin final sort of thought there also is the sensitivity of what we're getting. Um, you know, I think that when you're, when you're building algorithms or programming computers, or you're sort of first getting into analytics, right, we, my experience is we find a way to build these um, uh, models, and we take the models as the absolute truth, but what we forget to do is look at the sensitivity of the assumptions that we're making to create that model. And if we don't understand the connection between those two, again, we've got one number, not a range of possibilities. So to that point, uh, Kira, before we, um, when we were catching up a couple of days ago, you said something that stuck out. You said you're 50% data driven and 50% intuitive and led from the heart. And humans are not perfect. You also shared that your coach knows basically to the tenth of a second what you can run in a workout and prescribes your workouts, and then you nail those workouts. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious with with Houston where you ran that 219.12, how did, how did the, the suspension of belief in that no American had ever done that before, how did your ability to bring confidence to yourself, or did, your, did you have confidence in the data that led to the human experience of, I'm gonna go run really fast for 26.2 miles and do something that nobody's ever done before? I'm curious, like, how did, how did you rectify that? Yeah, I think it was entirely the data that gave me confidence in the training and everything. And every time I tried to look at that goal of being the fastest American woman ever, I couldn't wrap my head around that. That just put me into a tailspin. I'm like, okay, well, I can't think about that. So I just thought about what I can do and what am I running in my tempo runs and how are my trainings going and just the progression of I ran 222, I guess it was about a year and a half prior. And everything was trending faster than that and all of my work I was doing. So I just, even like the week leading into the race and kind of just searching for a little bit more confidence, I went back and looked through my workouts and what I was feeling comfortable running in the low five teens for tempo runs, whereas my goal was 518. So for me, I focused entirely on what I thought I could do and took away kind of the, just that, I don't know, the, the gravity of that goal. Um, but it's funny too, because before any sort of race or workout, I should say, my coach gives me a workout and I always think, well, there's no way I'm going to be able to do this today. And he's like, trust me, I've done the science. I know what your VO2 max is. I've calculated your splits. I know you can do this workout. And, um, and I do. And every day I go out and I hit it exactly like he told me to. So the, the day before a race, I'm just like, what's the workout tomorrow? He's like, you have 26.2 miles at 518 pace. I'm like, okay. All right, I got it, I can do that. If, you, if you're telling me that's the workout, I can do that. And he's like, I know, you know, and that gives me so much confidence that he's gone and done all of just the analysis of that and calculated that out. And there's a scientific formula. I come from a math background, so that brings me a lot of confidence. But, um, 
Yeah. <laughs> I, I love that because it is a reflection of your own history, mm -hmm. right? So that data is not made up and that data is you. And all he's doing is he's studying you and you're being a student of your own sport. And what's happening is over time, that bell-shaped curve is just moving over, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, it changes for each workout. So if it's really hot one day or if I'm not feeling so good or he's noticed a trend in my training, that always molds. So it's a very individual ass that he has. So I know that he's taken in all the factors. So there's a big like line of trust with him that will give me what I can do. I was going to ask your take on this because I was very curious, but your take was... Perfect. I love that. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it isn't against a standard like this big record that you're trying to do. The standard is always yourself, right? And you're resetting the standard each day in a training event, right? And then when that becomes normative, all of a sudden you know what's possible versus what isn't possible. And I think that there is this idea about peak performance as being a surprise, right? And it never is. On the flip side... Um, I want to get back. We talked about 50% this, 50% that. Ian, you said something in our chat earlier this week. Most people thrive in a place where they are in a place where they fail 50% of the time and succeed 50% of the time. And you, you have to know who the athlete is. Personally, if I fail 75% of the time, I'm thrilled because those 25%, that 25% success rate, it's going to be higher. Um, so... Curious your take from both the athlete side, and we also talked a lot about the business side. Um, Ian has a fantastic background at Scratch as well um, on the business side. So, so curious both the business and the, the applied athlete side of things on that, on that topic. Yeah, thanks, John. I think you know, in this world, right, we're thinking about a work, what I think of as a work design problem, and we're looking for that optimal challenge. And the place where we can all learn everything we ever want to know about optimal challenge is in video games. And you'll find that if you're playing video games, whether it's with your kid or with your own parents, that you were winning about half the time, no matter who you are, no matter, now, no matter what your skill level is. And this is another place where sort of this range comes in. So I think when you look at individuals, some people want to be told you're going to succeed and then they'll succeed. And there are other people where to motivate them to their maximum, you can tell them, you know, you can't do this. This is impossible. And that's exactly how you're going to get that individual to overcome and succeed. Um, and so again, this 50-50 rule, you know, is sort of the starting point, but you've got to look at the individual human behind it and, uh, you know, figure out what they need. So John, it sounds like for you, right, we want to set a really aggressive goal, a goal that you're not always going to achieve, um, you know, and care for, maybe for you, we're looking for something maybe on the other side where you have absolute confidence when somebody, when your coach says, you can do this, you believe it 100%, you know, you know it's going to happen. Alan, on the sports scientist side of things, where do you fall on deciding how, and understanding which side of the equation the athlete is? Whew. Um, I don't know, because I, I do also see a lot of randomness in, in the data, and I see a lot of luck. And in the world that I come from, the measurement standards and the environments are always changing. And so in professional road cycling, you know, it's, it's hit or miss. And I remember tour of Missouri many years ago, uh, one of the athletes I coached won the race and he was at the press conference and one of the journalists said, hey, when you woke up this morning, how did you feel your chances of winning were? Did you wake up thinking that you were going to win? And he looks back at this journalist and just starts shaking his head like, are you crazy? He was like, well, I woke up this morning and I realized there are 140 people in this race today, so I had one in 140 <laughs> chance of winning today, right? Um, and so, again, to Ian's earlier point, there's a separation between the outcome in terms of a victory and the metric for deciding that you did your best, right? For me, it really comes down to averages. I hate to go back to this idea, but it's this idea that I know that there's a workload that an athlete can consistently obtain. If they were able to kick that metric off, then it's good. And, you know, in some cases, it, it's kind of bad, too, because as you know, I was training guys for the Tour de France, and we knew that unless they could sustain for, uh, you know, a two-week rolling average, a workload of about 3,500 to 44,000 calories burn a day, they just didn't have the metabolism to survive the Tour de France, right? And so if I saw an athlete who was just, just burning to make the Tour team, and they were at 3,000 or 3,200, I was just like, look, 
you're not going to survive this race. And it almost becomes a call of you're going to fail, even though you want to, to change the human condition around that. Um, some stats don't lie in that sense, right? Because there's an absolute workload that everyone needs to be able to do to accomplish something that is that hard. Um, so, you know, I look at trends and I make sure that one good day, which might be two standard deviations of their rolling average, doesn't make them think that it represents um, what they're going to be doing tomorrow. But I do use that as a sign of saying, hey, this represents what might be possible. Because if you've done it one day, maybe we can get you at a point where you can consistently do it. That being said, I come from a different world than, say, Marathon, where I'm looking at stage race performance. I'm looking for things that can happen over and over and over again, as opposed to a, that one-off high over deviation. While we're talking about trends, Kira, I'm curious, uh, and so are a few of the people in the audience here, about how data has changed, how wearables, how the tools you use to help train have changed. You took a fair amount of time off between your, your running these days and your initial days as a runner, um, which you can tune into our podcast that we did <laughs> together um, to learn more about. But curious about your, your experience of the opposite sides of that gap in high-level training. It's been wild. Like I mentioned before, when I trained in the early 2000s, I just had a watch. So I, the data I was getting from the run was the duration, how long it took me. And unless I was on a track, I wasn't getting that feedback of speed or anything else. And really, that was the extent of it. And to get your, you know, your cadence or your stride length or your just thresholds or those kind of in-depth data, you were in a lab. Um, and those were limited conditions because those weren't real life. Um, you can't simulate how you would put everything on a line in a race like you would in a lab. Um, so that was kind of the data that I was used to in my first round of running. And then I took like an elaborate halftime show and came back and I feel like I'm running in the future now where I know my stride length and my cadence and I can see how my cadence is impacted on hills and elevation and how that pace changes. I have you know, my watch that I run in and I upload it all to Strava, which gives me all sorts of fun information. And I can see during a season of running, I'll do I'm kind of a creature of habit. So I'll do that same loop over and over and effortly that pace is getting down and that loop is getting quicker and I'm setting my like segment best even when I'm not trying. So that also really helps with my confidence, just seeing that like minuscule progress and see my cadence is getting better. And there's just so many different little factors now um, that I didn't have the first round. So, um, and that, you know, and that's just, actually I'm with Nike too. And I went through a whole study of which shoe would be most best for me in my form and my gait and my stride length. They gave me three different racing shoes. They gave me a pod to wear and a heart rate monitor. And they tracked me for weeks and weeks and weeks upon long runs and interval workouts and tempos. And by the end of that, I knew which shoe I was most efficient in if I was doing shorter work, which shoe I was most efficient in over a long run, which shoe I would cover, recover in quicker. So it was just all this data now is helping. So I know which shoe to wear on long runs so I'll recover and be able to be my best the next day. So it's just incredible. And just being able to use and manipulate that data to help find you know, your potential, it's really exciting. So we send astronauts to the moon to <laughs> explore in a vacuum, in a, in a perfectly curated experiment so that we can pull that down and apply it to life on Earth. You're, you're, you're detailing this experience of, they've literally called the moon, Project Moonshot, um, this perfectly curated um, and catered experience where you can try all the shoes, you can try all the gadgets. For someone who's maybe not, doesn't have a, a shoe contract, what are the takeaways from what you learned in that experience? And how can somebody who's sitting in the audience apply that to their own life? That's a really good question. I think, I mean, first and foremost, I think just going into like a specialty running store and getting fit is a really good place to start. But I think just looking for just the small things, like how do you feel? How are you recovering? Do your knees hurt? There's some shoes that I put on and I just, I can't run another step because they just don't work for me. So a lot of it's just, comfort. 
Um, but if you know, if you have the ability to do your own little taste test challenge here, a little challenge to do, you know, just see what works for you. Kira loves very... taste test challenges. <laughs> you can look at her Instagram for the Oreo. Uh, when challenges. you go in the Oreo aisle in the grocery store and there's 25 flavors, like I'm just really curious which is best. So I figure out which is best, and now I know which flavor to buy. But um, but that's a really good, and I think it's very individual. But it takes time and just kind of tracking those things and you know the pros and cons list and everything. But. Alan, how about, how about you? Um, you've run experiments on so many high-level athletes. Um, what, about, what are the takeaways for those who don't have access to, to tools like that? You know, I think uh, the technology has democratized the process really, really well. Um, I do think that the bottom line is speed, right? And depending upon the course that you're challenging yourself against, you can always run very controlled experiments in very, very simple ways. It doesn't have to be all that complex, right? So like, you know, some athletes can't afford a wind tunnel or a power meter to understand aerodynamic drag, but you can pedal up to a given speed or start at the top of a hill and coast down to measure that drag, right? Um, you may not be able to measure how much workload you're doing, but you can see on a given course if your speed is increasing, right? And you can try different interventions and see if that's repeatable. I think it does take a lot of time. You have to deal with one variable at a time and that can be really, really hard. Um, I used to do a thing a lot of time with the athletes I worked where I would make up big old stories about an intervention. And the bigger the story I told and the more wazzle dazzle, um, the more of a placebo effect I would get, right? And what's really, really interesting is I loved these placebo effects because I could always get short-term performance, but only short-term performance. The thing about a placebo is that when it's really good, it lasts for about a month, and then it goes away, right? And when we were experimenting with different interventions, if it was a good intervention, then it rose above that placebo noise. And after four, five weeks, it kept on causing a positive impact to performance, right? And those positive impacts to performance can range the gamut from, say, the equipment that you have to even, you know, for us in the Tour de France, it was realizing that a really, really good meal immediately after the stage on the team bus rather than waiting, it literally turned into a bowl of chicken fried rice where, like, on the 17th day of the tour, I'm going around asking the guys what they want, and they're just like, we are not having anything else but chicken fried rice, right? It rose above the noise. Let's talk more about nutrition. Um, how are you measuring nutrition? You both work at Scratch Labs and founded Scratch Labs. Um, how are you using nutrition to inform or how is data informing your use of nutrition? Yeah, I think we're doing a really generally a very, very bad job of it. I think that there are so many sensors out there right now that measure workload, that measure even say blood glucose, et cetera. But there's one major pitfall in nutrition is that for the most part, um, food diaries don't work. You know, there's tons of evidence out there that if I ask you to write down everything that you're eating, right? that you do a really poor job of quantifying that. Mm -hmm. And now if you're giving that to a, a nutritionist or a scientist who's really good at analyzing data, right? They're really good at analyzing bad data, <laughs> right? Because you didn't get the grams of carbohydrate, right? You didn't get the amount of fat, right? You didn't get the micronutrients, right? And then even if you go beyond that layer into the library of where all of those calories and that macro, micro breakdown was, this is like data from the 1920s. Those food libraries haven't been updated in a long time. I mean, we've never taken an energy bar into a bomb calorimeter and detonated it to see if it actually had the same amount of calories. We're trusting these old libraries for our nutrition fact panels, right? And so there's a big, big hole there. Um, I do think that there are two really interesting innovations that are coming up. One is something called the Global Nutrition Project, which is a global project that, re, that aims to redo the library of food database. They're literally redoing all the chemical analysis of the food that we can consume, buy, and eat and reestablishing those libraries. That's a big, big step with respect to accurate nutrition data. And then the, the other innovation is a, a company called Opsys Health, 
and they've made recognition software on a phone that allows you to literally take a video recording of the food, measures volume, density, and recognizes the nutrient content of that food. And while it may not be perfect and there's a bunch of machine learning going on in there, it's, I believe, at least a lot more consistent than individuals guessing. Kira, how about your experience as, as an athlete? Yeah, for me, I don't train at a training center. I don't work with a whole team of people. Like I started out on this journey for running completely alone in Richmond, Virginia with a coach. And um, at first it was kind of guess and check. And I'd be starting to train for a marathon and I'd get really dizzy on a run and I'd go back and Google it, or I should say Bing it. My husband works at Microsoft. <laughs> um, and I'd see, oh, you didn't have enough carbohydrates or you didn't have enough protein. And then I would start bonking at the end of a run and then I'd go back and Bing it and figure that out. And then actually I came across, I'm like, I need to stop guessing and start analyzing. And I would go to my, you know, my um, primary care doctor and they'd run my blood and be like, yep, you're good to go. And I'm like, well, for an average person, but I'm running 100 some miles a week. You know, that's a little bit uh, crazy. So I need to see someone that can kind of deal with the craziness. So I actually reached out to Inside Tracker and I get my blood analyzed every quarter now for all of my biomarkers. And it was so interesting for me to see now what is off for, for an endurance athlete and why now I'm feeling those symptoms. And so every quarter I'll see that I'm low in vitamin D, which that surprised me because I'm out in the sun two to three hours a day. How am I low in vitamin D? Um, but I've been able to take away and through all those biomarkers, I've been able to change and through nutrition to make sure that my body's getting uh, what it needs. So it's um, it stopped being guess and check and now I just rely on the data. Um, going back to something you said earlier, um, it's putting it in the context of you, right? All of this data you mentioned for on the blood work side of things, it's not about everybody in this room, it's about you. It's about how, do, how does it apply to you? Um, so I'm, I'm curious on the, um, I guess when, you, when, you're, when, you're, when you're coming to it, maybe we'll ask this one to, to Alan. When you're just starting as an athlete, where, where do you look? Like, what, how, do you, how do you understand the low-hanging fruit, to use another food pun there? Yeah, jeez. I don't know. Where do you look? <laughs> you look to your urges and your desires. <laughs> um, and I say that not so facetiously because there is this idea in physiology, you know, uh, called the hedonistic response, right? We are very well calibrated and designed to survive. And so mechanisms like thirst, mechanisms like hunger, mechanisms like fatigue and our desire to want to go to bed at night, while we think of them as very kind of gray areas, they're incredibly powerful forces that allow us to survive, right? And I think that for the most part, where I've, when I approach a new athlete, it's always about trying to get a sense of where they're calibrated on these factors. Right? Where are you calibrated with respect to how tired you feel? Where are you calibrated in terms of how much sleep you think you need? Where are you calibrated in terms of how much food you naturally want to eat? Where are you calibrated in terms of your th thirst mechanism for uh, hydration? And then you can use really low tech tools to solve that. So for example, I'll always start a brand new athlete with never prescribing hydration. I'll always just say, if you're thirsty, have a drink. If you're not, don't worry about it. But we'll measure pre-post weight. And we'll take an assessment of, hey, are you dehydrating a ton or are you not? And if they're dehydrating a ton, instead of saying, hey, I'm going to ask you to drink more, I think to myself, well, what's a driver for thirst? And what's a driver for thirst that they might be losing on this run? Well, that would be sodium, salt, right? So instead of saying drink more, I would say, hey, you're losing a ton of weight. Why don't you have some more salt the next time you run and see if your intuition about how much to drink changes. And if that fixes itself, we're on the right course. We'll do the same thing for food against, say, changes in body weight, right? We'll do the same thing against training load and, say, sleep. So it can be a very intuitive process if you're methodical about it and you're constantly challenging athletes and yourself with questions. The measurement tools don't have to be that high tech. Speaking of challenging yourself and sort of 
breaking through the noise. Um, where is the noise the loudest when it comes to data? And is it training? Is it recovery, nutrition, race day performance, or just yes, all of it? I'm gonna let Ian answer. Ian, you had a great answer to this, and it was about business. Where's the greatest noise in data? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> the answer you but gave too many to me. Conversations. The answer you gave me was the greatest amount of noise is in marketing. <laughs> uh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to know, right? We're being sold so many devices to measure so many things. And if you bring this back to like very simple statistics, what you're dealing with is a multiple regression problem, right? You're trying to understand if a bunch of data correlates to this, you know, dependent measure, say performance or running speed, right? And on this table, you have forks, you have knives, you have spoons, you have your plate, you have all these things that correlate with this, this thing called your meal or this thing called your speed, right? But what's happening that I see in the industry is that there are 20 companies selling you, you know, 10 different knives, right? And you only have one spoon and one fork. Well, you can throw away nine of those knives and still get the same answer. And in a perfect multiple regression, what's happening is each dependent variable correlates, or each independent variable correlates well with that, with the dependent variable. But none of the uh, independent variables correlate well with one another, right? And what's end, what ends up happening, for example, and I'll give you a great example around on sleep, we were putting EEGs on athletes during the Tour de France, and we had so much data. And I was so excited about analyzing this data. But when I did, I realized that every single one of these sleep metrics correlated perfectly with the total amount of sleep time and with one, one another, which made us realize that all of that measurement was useless because it didn't add to the regression. All we needed to do was ask the athletes what time you went to bed and what time you woke up in that context, right? It's interesting how you can, it, like, you can make it so complicated, but when you get back to it, it's one foot in front of the other. That's right. Rest, do it again. That's right. And one eat. spoon, one fork, one knife. I think Kira oh. embodies the like simplification of the experience, right? You're doing it for fun. You have a full-time job. You don't need the running contract. So I'm curious, like, how does your, how does that very subjective experience of fun lead you to have objective and tangible success? Yeah, it's, it, this is such a deep question for me because when I came back into the competitive running space, I was so nervous that it wouldn't be fun. And I ran competitively right out of college and it felt like work, you know? And there was a lot of pressure and I was trying to, that was trying to make it my career. So there was all these sort of pressures on it that took away the fun. So coming back as a mom of two and a husband at the time that was deployed, I needed running to be fun. Like that was my space in my day. I was, I needed it to be fun. So I was really hesitant to go all in and to try to work harder because I was so worried that they were inversely related and that the harder I worked, the less fun I would have. And this is what I need in my life as a, it's just being chaotic. And so I kind of, you know, kind of dipped my toe in the deep end at first and started slowly adding stuff. And I realized through this that one, you can have fun, you can be working really hard. I work really hard to make sure this is my fun thing. But, um, so they're not inversely rated. But then when I got into it, I hid behind fun with running. So I'd go into a race and my goal was to have fun. So it didn't matter if I actually ran my time goal or not, did I have fun, yes. And when that was my primary goal, it took off all the pressure and I was able to succeed at a new level, which turns out succeeding is fun. <laughs> so I was having more fun than I've ever had in my life. Um, but I kind of tricked my way into it. And it took me a while to figure out I was hiding behind the fun to take away the pressure. Um, and I think, because I think I was just afraid of that. But I don't know, now I'm embracing the fun. I show up, I have a really good time with it. And I think it's been really powerful to see that you don't, it doesn't need to be serious. Like, you know, I'm running, I'm not saving lives. Like we, uh, we can go out and have a good fun, a good time running in circles. But yeah, it's, uh, it's been an interesting journey for me. <laughs> that is for sure. Um, Ian, 
to the same point, you're leading, you're leading a company. Mm -hmm. You have tangible goals. Um, how do you ensure that the goals don't get in the way of teamwork and camaraderie and, and balancing, again, the objective with the subjective measures of success? Yeah, you know, the first thing that comes to mind for me there, John, is a lot of people talk about, you know, businesses where you've got some version of what a good culture is. They talk about them like families. And where I think that's a fallacy is that in a family, you can't get fired. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried. <laughs> well, I think we probably all have, right? Yeah. Um, but in a team, you can get fired. And a team is there in a way that a family may not be, right? For better or for worse. And I think that if we acknowledge that we do have to succeed together uh, or fail together, but that we can also have outliers who become bottlenecks who need to get fired, um, and do it with a place, or do it coming from a place of compassion where we can acknowledge and realize that maybe that individual moving on is the best thing for them as well uh, as for the team. Uh, you know, that there's probably somewhere where they fit better, where they are gonna be able to contribute. Um, and that those things don't have to be held uh, at odds with each other. They can, they can fit into one, one, one piece of the same, same pie. Speaking of culture, you said um, that you have a unique ability to speak multiple languages. You didn't mean actual languages, you meant science, math, et cetera. Um, I'm curious how that, how that enables you to, to play in a bunch of different sandboxes here. Yeah, um, I don't know that I can even hardly speak English, so I definitely don't speak multiple languages uh, in, a, in the literal sense. Um, but I've had an interesting background. I mean, I dropped out of college you know, after one whole semester to go play bike racer and traveled the world and um, you know, visited a whole bunch of countries and a whole, had a whole bunch of different teammates with you know, different cultural backgrounds. Um, and then you know, nine years later with a vascular problem, found myself back in a you know, calculus three class after having done known math between the two um, you know, as a 28 year old undergrad. And um, you know, when Alan and I started Scratch Labs, um, you know, I'll never forget the, the day we had our first sales meeting with Whole Foods Market. And um, they asked us what a gross margin was and neither of us even knew what that question meant. Uh, and quite literally looked that up on Wikipedia um, and then sort of laughed at the equation and it didn't make a whole bunch of sense to me. Um, but I think that if we approach the world and we're not embarrassed to ask questions, right? We're not embarrassed to admit that we run a business and don't know what a gross margin is, um, that we can ask those questions that maybe sometimes people take for granted. Um, and it enables us to communicate across these boundaries that um, you know, they prop up artificially, um, you know, whether it's from the lingo inside of business, whether it's from the jargon that exists in endurance athletics, uh, or whether it's you know, from having a table full of too many knives. Um, <laughs> we can get across those barriers. Very cool. I think it's, you talked a lot about the curiosity and it's just like, how do we get the best out of what we're doing? And sometimes you, you don't know, you know what you don't know, and sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Like yeah, I think, knife to use. yeah, b blind spots are hard, right? I mean, there are blind spots by definition and, um, you know, there's some great tools out there to help, uh, help sort of uh, cut through that noise, if you will. Um, you know, Jahari Windows, one of my personal favorites, if people are familiar. Um, yeah, I don't know. Just, just acknowledge that we don't know. <laughs> Ask for feedback and listen to the feedback. You know, try and get our egos out of the way. Question that has popped up a handful of times from the audience. Um, Alan, you were involved in the invention of the power meter. How did that idea come about, and did you think it would have grown to be as popular as it is today in the workout community? <laughs> well, you know, in the late 80s, there was a guy named Uli Schoberer out of Germany. He's this really cool, eccentric engineer. And he had invented the first power meter, which was a crank-based power meter. It was so expensive. I mean, this thing was like $15,000 when it first came out, and that's in late 80s, early 90s money. And I think everybody thought it was kind of stupid and crazy, and cycling is all, you know, tradition and bread and water and pasta and all that, right? Um, but I realized that it was very, very simple, right? It was you know, in strength training, you could measure how much mass you were lifting. And on a track, you could measure how fast somebody was running. But in cycling, where the environment's really, really dynamic, you didn't have this opportunity to measure the actual training load. You couldn't measure how hot the stove was. And so I became really, really fascinated in how we could do this. And um, I got really, really lucky at a trade show. I met some engineers here out of Cambridge 
and they were interested in the same question, and we started collaborating together, and that ended up turning into all of my PhD work, and that uh, system was called the PowerTap. It was the first commercially available uh, power meter in the United States, and it was orders of magnitude cheaper, because we realized it was just a bunch of strain gauges on a torque tube. Um, it didn't have to be all that complicated, and it allowed us to move the lab into the field for the very first time, which opened up a lot of really cool possibilities with respect to data and measurement. And really fun games like Zwift. Yeah, yeah, crazy <laughs> games like Zwift and everything uh, in between. But really all it was was a thermometer, right? We were effectively baking bread in hot ovens without ever knowing what the temperature was. And all the power meter really did, and I think people overcomplicated it, is it gave us a thermometer so that we could start to understand individual recipes a little better. I'm gonna read something you shared in our chat yesterday, but I wanna ask Kira her take on it. Um, you said a lot of people come into data because they're insecure. If the data can make you more secure, that's the experience we're looking for. It sounds like you figured that out. You figured out how to take your coach's input and use it to build confidence. For an athlete who might be a little less secure in their own abilities or a little less um, confident in their abilities, where do they start? I think just tracking the progress is so important. And I think initially you're not gonna see that improvement. It takes a little bit. So I think just on a whole looking at how many miles you did or how many hours or just tracking that you're putting money in the bank and just trusting that, I mean, for running, it's a consistency game. It's, pun intended, it's the long run, right? So you're training for, for the, a marathon for the long run, there you go. But it's, it's, it's a compilation of work over weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. So um, I think just for me, just trusting in that every time I go for a run, I'm kind of putting money in the bank. Um, and sometimes you don't necessarily see it that day, um, but, you know, when I'm leading into a race, I go back and look at all the miles I've run, and I've said that. I look at all the improvement I've had, and that just really helps settle the nerves. Because I think it's, you know, leading to a race, it's just nerve-wracking, right? You've been training for months and months and months, and really, for marathon, you could do two, maybe a year. So you put a lot of weight on this one event to show you the result, kind of like we talked about earlier, this result of your fitness. And sometimes that goes well and sometimes it doesn't. I think I have really thick skin. So for me, when it doesn't go well, I'm like, oh, that race didn't matter. That, you know, that doesn't change the body of work. Let's just pretend like you hit that goal and move forward. Um, so yeah. So I titled my podcast, For the Long Run. And the slogan is exploring the why behind what keeps runners running long, strong, and motivated. And 200 conversations in, I've learned the secret. The secret is consistency. Nothing, nothing else matters at the end of the day. It's, did you do the work? Good beats perfect because you can do good for more than you can do perfect. Um, and I've just found it so fascinating that, that you know, in the 150 plus conversations I've had with professional athletes, they continue to reaffirm the focus on the process and the focus on how consistency and being consistently good or average or above average can lead to excellent outcomes if you're doing all of the, you know, the other stuff. Um, Alan, I'm, I'm curious on, um, if you want to elaborate a little bit more on that conversation we were having yesterday about um, insecurity in the data and unknown algorithms, which you definitely wanted to cover. Yeah, you know, we do live in this world of hidden algorithms now, right? And we're, I think, maybe losing sight of what the source data is, right? What is the actual number that we are measuring, that we can measure, and why do we always have to multiply it by a bunch of fudge factors to create a really neat number that sits between one and 100, mm -hmm. right? I, I don't think that that's necessary. I think that we maybe think people are dumb, but raw data is probably the best data in, in, in my mind, right? I want to know what the actual number is, and I don't want it to be hidden by uh, too much math. Um, you know, with that in mind, um, back to this consistency point, you know, I'm always looking for just one number that represents the whole of, of, of work, and work is intensity times time, 
So however you want to measure intensity, right? There's only one way to measure time. And then if you multiply those two things together, you get a work index. And that's all you fundamentally need to understand somebody's training load. Now, if you take that and you take a two week or three week or four week rolling average of that, now you understand what someone did on one given day versus their history. And if you want a training adaptation, then you've got to go across that line of average. And if you want to rest, you need to go below that line. Right? And there's probably some deviation up in the upper two and a half percentile, whatever, two standard deviations, where if you reach that line, your biology is going to probably regress back to the middle. And so those can only come infrequently. Right? It's a very simplistic way, I think, of looking at this data in this particular world. And nobody really looks at it this way. We're just throwing a lot of numbers on the table and trying, letting our minds take mental shortcuts around it. Um, so. Maybe a follow-up question um, that has come in from Twitter here. Does looking at training load average blur the importance of differentiated training, especially in endurance sports where there's a growing importance on a large body of work? You know, I think that when it comes to the consistency in the long run, um, it probably doesn't matter, right? That will come out in the noise. And if your overall habits are consistent, then that training load measure, however it is, is going to be just fine. I think that we had this conversation earlier. How do you account now for your physical therapy, your massage? How do you account for your mental state? How do you account for all these other boxes that you can check that either enhance your training or your recovery, your strength training, et cetera? Um, I don't know what the, the, the answer to that is. I don't know if it's a score, if it ends up being something like you know counting cards in blackjack where now you're just increasing your probability or decreasing your probability of making a good bet on a given day, right? Um, and sometimes I reflect that maybe it's actually just visual because when I look at big spreadsheets with this data, you start to just see patterns, right? And that's what kind of machine learning is all about is just recognizing those, those, those patterns. But I think that we're very visual, at least I am, and there's a whole new world out there around visualization of this data that hasn't really been tapped into yet. Very cool. Um, Another question from the audience. As a former collegiate runner, I noticed a wide range of training philosophies in the running world. Some seem legit, while others definitely less so. With the influx of data, that, with the influx of data have you seen any of these fringe ideas confirmed or old pillars of training debunked? Kira, let's start with you, particularly with the long career you've had. Yeah, uh, really long. <laughs> uh, this is a really interesting question, and I think um, I've always said there's not one way up the mountain. So I think when you look back at like the training methods that were really popular, like for the first running boom, it was just like go out and run the mileage. And that still is pretty effective. Like when I started running um, this round, I was trying just to run 10 miles a day to get a root beer float every night. That was my solo goal when I started that. And pretty silly that the carrot at the end was a root beer float, but I got into great shape just because I was running 10 miles every day, which is about 70 miles a week, to try to get my root beer float. Um, since I've been back in training, I've taken a very unique approach to marathon running with the help of my coach, Scott Roscoe. Um, I train a lot more like a 10K runner um, with a long run. So I do a lot of speed work. I work really hard to get my mile time down, my 5K, my 10K. If on the day when I ran the American record on the marathon, if you would have said, you know, course is closed, this is a 10K race, I think I would have PR, I know I would have PR'd in the 10K that day. Um, so I think that training, as we have more data and we have more technology, I think it's gonna evolve and we can perfect it. But I think that kind of just going back, I think the most important like technique in running is just the consistency and the patience. Um, but yeah. Ian, curious your thoughts. I come back to the individual nature of things, and I think, you know, a, an analogy that maybe we all see, uh, I know I see day in and day out with people, is how fanatical people get about certain diets, and that, you know, in society right now, right, oversimplification, but, you know, we've got this, uh, you know, vegan, plant-based, obsessive, extreme movement, and we've got this, um, you know, paleo, 
um, <laughs> you know, keto extreme movement. And that the people who get so passionate about each of those extremes, they're passionate because it works for them. And you need to both recognize and acknowledge that it works for them and not confuse that with the expectation that it's gonna work for you. And be open-minded enough to look past that and figure out what it is that works for you. So, you know, I, I don't know about running, um, but in, in pro cycling, um, you know, the idea of big miles or really hard intervals and lots of rest uh, is sort of prescriptive. And I think we've got to acknowledge that different people are good at different things and lean into that and be willing to, you know, to trust your own experiences, to trust your own data, and, um, you know, not quite, like maybe put some blinders on so we're not always grass is greener with what somebody else is, is doing. Uh, in a world of data, that's really, really hard to do. Um, it's hard to have confidence and, you know, be different than what other people are doing. Yeah, to echo Ian's statement, I don't think we know the answer to that because you can see two performances, right? Two people winning a particular race, but do so using completely different physiological mechanisms, right? And so one person may get to the line using, you know, uh, primarily anaerobic energy sources and surge and recover and surge and recover and get the same net speed as somebody who's doing it completely aerobically because they've got different physiological systems at play to try to attempt to get the same result. And that would thus dictate that each individual would have to train differently to optimize their own unique physiology. You know, to, to also bring another perspective to that question, there's also the concept of specificity of training. And this is where I think the data is really good because you can now look at the demands of a given race and you can start to match your training load in either parts or as a whole to the specific aspects, whether it's the speed or the distance, right? Or the change in terrain or the geography or the weather. And that specificity of training is still probably the overruling principle rather than any kind of, you know, uh, training fad. Got a question from uh, Ross Tucker here, and it is, we're going to answer this one in just numbers. If you took all of these measurement devices to E10 Kenya and gave it to the best 30 Kenyan men and women distance runners for 12 months, how much faster do you think we'd see the world record for both men and women? Just a number. Three percent. This feels like uh, the price is right. Go, <laughs> You're going to go under or over? I'm going one percent. <laughs> I have no idea. No clue. I, I mean, I want to believe that as humans, we've found a way to optimize, um, you know, through intuition, uh, through a large population base, but that could be total... Yes. Yeah, the, the question might not be how much better does the population get, but like how many more people can get better? Well, and arguably then as a whole, if more people are better, then more people are going to be pushing each other and just the whole group total. Yeah, so maybe there will be multiple, multiple people that can get to that level rather than that just one. Well, then it's the confidence piece in that it's the same thing what we saw with breaking the four-minute barrier. Once it happened, it just happened over and over and over again. Yeah. But I also think that it depends on what the measurement device is because there are some really, really bad measurement tools out there. And the measurement tools that I have found that work the best is if you give that measurement tool to somebody who has zero experience using it, is totally ignorant in uh, what it is or what it means, but when they start to use it, they're getting feedback that is changing and affecting their behavior in real time and all of a sudden it becomes an intuitive ping, right? That they can click and get an echo back. But there are too many devices out there, I think, that when you click, you get no feedback. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, as you said, it's the, the noise is marketing and it's how do you use the tool? How do you use it appropriately? And how do you understand what works for you? Um, I want to thank you all so much for sharing all of this wisdom and some jokes and uh, um, the questions from the audience. Uh, this has been a pleasure. Hope you all have enjoyed it. And feel free to, um, these three are very accessible on the internet and um, you can ask them questions afterwards. And uh, 
uh, re just really appreciate the opportunity to, to share their knowledge with, uh, with you guys. Thanks.